Uh, hello everyone, and um, it will be nice to welcome you today here. Um, today we start our winter series of Algae AD webinars. And today um, our main focus of um, this uh, webinar is microalgae grown on digestate as a fish feed. So this is results coming out from our capitalization work package, extension of Algae AD project, where we use microalgae growing on digestate as an aqua feed and two types of trials were made, one in uh, Swans University and another one in CNRS, France. And first speakers of today, it will be uh, Philippe Soudan, who is a director of research at CNRS, and his research um, is on the study of the lipid composition of marine organisms, as well as the study of the physiological mechanisms regulated lipid synthesis, dietary acquisition, and allocation. And his scientific interests cover various marine organisms, including microalgae, bivalves, copepod fish, and all this complexity and diversity, and various scales from the subcellular scale to the ecosystem. So Philippe, um, I give you the floor, so please, um, now time for your presentation. Also, uh, for the um, uh, question, if you have any question, please put them uh, in the Q&A section and we will be answering them after two talks. Thank you. Thank you, Alain, for the introduction. Uh, before I start, um, I would like to thank the Interreg the Northwest Europe for funding the Algade project. The general objective of the Algade project is to develop uh, innovative technologies uh, for using uh, nitrogen-rich effluents from uh, anaerobic digestion to produce macroalgae and convert them into commercial products for animal feed and fish feed. Um, so first, the, the aim of the, this presentation is to give you some uh, general information on the downstream processing used to, from cultivated macroalgae biomass to the production of ingredients uh, for aqua feed uh, and also some information on the feed trial that we perform using that uh, macroalgae uh, biomass. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you here uh, just a few background information on the Algade project. This project started with a general observation that increasing uh, amount of organic waste, uh, organic matter waste, are being treated by anaerobic digestion in Northwest Europe. This process indeed converts organic matter waste into biogas to produce energy. However, uh, has the counterpart of producing a liquid effluent rich in nitrogen called digestate. And currently, uh, that digestate is mainly used um, uh, as a soil uh, fert fertilizer. Like other uh, soil fertilizer and um, biologic one, its application in excess uh, affect uh, an arm uh, aquatic environment. And so using this excess nutrient to produce microalgae could limit their uh, environmental impact of uh, such uh, nitrogen-rich waste and also producing innovative, uh, innovative ingredients for animal feed and profit. So the whole project is part of uh, um, eco a circular economy approach that you can see summarized in that, in that figures. Uh, the algae project therefore features on the frame part of that figure and has been structured uh, in three major tasks. Um, that interact with the torture, of course, to meet the uh, socioeconomic and environmental uh, challenge. The first task was to produce macroalgae biomass from this uh, nutrient rich digestate. The second task was to develop environmental friendly process, transforming the macroalgae biomass into feed and carrying out animal uh, uh, trials on piglets and fish. But here we're just going to talk about the fish. And the third task was to carry out uh, a market analysis and developing decision support tools to assess the socioeconomic feasibility and environmental impact of the process implement from cultivation to feed production. So I will just do um, say a few words on the market analysis at the end of, of the presentation. Um, so the Algede project, um, uh, the part of the down, downstream processing is as well divided um, in three main activity. Uh, the first one includes 
quality monitoring, harvesting, and storage of the biomass. The second activity includes the fractionation and biochemical characterization of the biomass. And the last activity includes feed formulation, the feed trials, and the market analysis. So, like I said, uh, although the market analysis is listed as last, it was a main concern at the beginning of the project. So, considering the low margin animal feed and aquafit sectors, we knew that given the cost of producing macroalgae biomass and the downstream processing involved, it was very essential that the, the final ingredient provide a real nutri nutritional benefit. So, so it was with that uh, this uh, economic constraint in mind that we focus on omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid and peptides as an ingredient here, without uh, excluding other high-value uh, added uh, compounds. So, uh, before starting uh, the downstream processing, it is important to assess the quality of the biomass according to the cultivated species and culture uh, condition. And so, we generally use microscopy and flow cytometry uh, that allow to monitor the health of the microalgae on a uh, several times a day. So when the culture uh, appears to be in good health, then we can move on and look for the biochemical quality and then draw up some uh, biochemical profile of this biomass. Uh, so that gives us some uh, general information to evaluate possible cultivation drift or seasonal variation. And also uh, it allows us to assess the production yield of the target, uh, targeted uh, ingredients. Uh, the biomass harvesting, which aim to eliminate as much as possible the water, is a key step because it partly determines the downstream processing that it can be applied to this uh, biomass. Uh, there are many parameters to uh, take into account, like cell fragility or final concentration expected, or uh, the, the form in which the biomass is stored and the storage capaci capacity that is uh, available. So here uh, we, uh, <coughs> we use um, Cross flow filtration with our macroalgae biomass. So it is a system allowed to obtain a biomass at 10% solid matter. And in some cases, if needed, you can also combine it with centrifugation to increase the solid, uh, solid matter percentage. Uh, one of the advantages of the cross flow uh, filtration is that the water extracted from the macroalgae. Biomass is clean and sterile, and then it can be reused. Um, then after there's a storage step, uh, which may seem pretty uh, trivial, but it is not because uh, it can really quickly uh, become a headache. Uh, in the algae project, algae project, uh, we choose to store the biomass at minus 20, uh, mostly because we had to store it for several months before we can set the next steps of down, uh, downstream processing. So uh, from the, the one issue is the storage space. Like for instance, uh, we, we have to find to store like 600 liters of uh, uh, concentrated biomass at uh, 100 gram per liter. So that's uh, can uh, storage space is an issue. And then another issue is to make sure that the biomass remains stable uh, at minus 20. Um, and also you have to keep in mind the transportation of frozen biomass. Um, to the place where it will be uh, undergo the downstream processing. So this step must be carefully uh, managed and because it is first is costly and also risky because if uh, you may have uh, some issue or problem with the cold chain so and lost all your biomass. So also the, the other option uh, is, to, uh, is to dry the biomass either by spray drying or freeze drying and this has a double advantage of reducing both the volume to be stored, of course, and the risk of degradation due to the presence of, of water. Uh, freeze drying is the most expensive, but the safest one, uh, while spray drying requires the addition usually of antioxidants, especially when the biomass contains a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acid. So that that's depends on your strategy, the, the way you use the biomass. Um, Drying the biomass uh, also it can be interesting if you can uh, directly process it into feed animals or aqua feed if it is economically uh, profitable. Uh, however, if the downstream processing requires some rehydration 
or in our case, uh, enzymatic hydrolysis, then it's better to avoid a drain step that is, uh, which generates uh, additional cost. So uh, after, uh, there is some uh, fractioning steps that are possible to extract some specific compounds of uh, nutrient interest for animal feed or aqua feed. Uh, the implementation of that uh, fractioning uh, processes depends on what we are trying to value. For example, here, uh, uh, omega-3 polyinsaturate fatty acid or peptides in our project. At last, it also depends on some environmental considerations, such as uh, the carbon in uh, water consumption, the use of chemicals such as solvent, so on and so forth. So within the Algade uh, project, we choose to carry out uh, enzymatic hydrolysis to extract our compounds of interest, so omega-3 polyinsaturate fatty acid and peptides. So that kind of approach uh, allows us to have a environment-friendly approach for lipid extraction, avoiding the use of organic solvent first. And in the meantime, it follows the production of peptide with uh, potential antimicrobial, immunostimulant, or uh, antioxidant activity. So for regarding the enzymatic hydrolysis, so it was uh, performed, like I mentioned before, on concentrate uh, biomass. And so that uh, procedure was developed and optimized uh, at, the, at the lab scale for so adjusting temperature, pH, uh, type of, and quantity of enzyme. Once the process was optimized at lab scale, we controlled the, his uh, biochemical composition. And, and then after we move up to the pilot scale uh, to, uh, uh, with the subcontractor, <clears throat> then the cheese hydrolyzed biomass was spread wide with addition of antioxidant or freeze dry in some case to limit the degradation of the uh, ingredient, especially the, the omega-3 PUFA. And the animal trial was performed on both uh, piglet and fish by including hydrolyzed uh, biomass and non-hydrolyzed biomass in the feed. And here I'm just going to present uh, the, the, the fish, uh, fish trial. So, uh, in front of we performed the, the fish trial, uh, the feed trial, sorry, uh, on Sibas, Juvenis, and Larvae. So uh, uh, the, the, <coughs> the, the fish feed uh, was uh, formulated with a specialized uh, subcontractor in order to include 15% of otherized and non-otherized uh, uh, macroalgae uh, biomass. Uh, we conducted two experiments of nutrition, one of six weeks with Sibas, Juvenis, and one of four weeks with Sibas Larvae. For those two experiments, uh, we monitor survival, growth performance, and the assimilation of the feed uh, nutrients. As you can see, the, the, the fish feed formulation can be quite complex because it has to include several commercial ingredients. So here our objective was to replace the fish oil, all the fish oil that is usually part of the fish feed, and part of the fish meal as well. We reduce it by 12%, and we also reduce the lecithin uh, uh, inclusion, and we also remove the, 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 the cellulose. So the main objective of that uh, formulation with Macquarie was to increase the DHA supply and the DHA on EPA ratio by including that uh, microalgae biomass in the fish feed. Then we control uh, the fatty acid composition of both feeds, fish feeds, uh, the control and the algae uh, uh, feed. Uh, for some uh, reason that the DHA was indeed, and as well the DHA and EPA ratio were indeed uh, higher than our expectation. Uh, maybe because that when we did the analysis, we just used a small part of the, of the biomass and maybe it was not well mixed enough. Anyway, so we were above expectation, which we can consider as good. Uh, and then uh, we feed that uh, our Sibas juveniles for six weeks with controlled diet on algae diet. Uh, a good growth uh, was obtained uh, with both uh, fish feed, the standard one and the algae one. And the nutritional uh, trial uh, revealed that 15% of uh, standard fish feed can be replaced by our macroalgae biomass. 
Uh, next, uh, we look at the fatty acid composition of the Cibas juvenis after six weeks of that uh, dietary uh, conditioning. And today, we just focus on the results we obtained on the essential fatty acid, so the arachidogenic acid, the EPA, and the, the DHA. So on the left, uh, you can uh, have the can see the proportion in lipids from the live liver, and on the right, the one uh, from the from the from the muscles. So in the liver, uh, we, we can observe a significant and quite drastic increase of DHA as supplied by the macroalgae biomass, while the DHA increased muscle was not that that not that big. Um, <clears throat> It likely reflect that liver bet better and faster uh, uh, was faster influenced uh, by the fatty acid composition of the diet, mostly because it's closer to the digestive system, and we can expect that the muscle, which is a bigger uh, tissue biomass, will take more time to reflect the dietary change. Uh, overall, we can conclude that the macroalgae uh, biomass was well incorporated, simulated in that uh, fish feed, fish tissue. Sorry. For the um, sorry. For the neutral trial on Sibas larvae, we tested the inclusion of of 15% of both hydrolyzed and non-hydrolyzed uh, macroalgae biomass in the larvae feed. Uh, the feeding with control on algae uh, larvae started when the larvae were 20 days old, and we have been able to monitor the weight of the larvae per tank after 26 and 31 days of rearing. Uh, first thing uh, that was quite disappointing, that we were the fairly large uh, variability between tanks, as you can see, uh, with some mortality in some tanks, independent of uh, dietary conditioning. Nevertheless, uh, we, can, uh, we may observe that the trend in favor of the feed containing 15% of non hydrolyzed biomass. After 41 days of rearing, the tanks with the highest uh, number of live larvae was uh, noticed in, in tank with the larvae fed containing the 15% of non hydrolyzed biomass. Uh, we have ongoing uh, biochemical uh, analysis to assess whether uh, the hydrolyzed, non hydrolyzed macroalgae biomass uh, were well uh, assimilated. Um, so, uh, for the conclusion of the field trial, uh, feed, feed trials, uh, the non hydrolyzed biomass uh, can partially replace fish meal and fish oil in Sibas juvenile feed. It follows fairly good growth um, and improves the DHA uh, delivery to Sibas juvenile. Uh, so, however, the, the variability between uh, larvae and ribbon tanks did not allow to, to obtain clear conclusion. So, that's Needs essentially to be uh, repeat. Next, that we we have to do is to to confirm uh, the the zootechnical and biochemical result we obtained with uh, juvenis, and also we have to now to better optimize the workflow between the the macroagriculture and the fish feed uh, production. Uh, Ala, am I behind deadline all the time or? Yeah, it's fine. Just I'm fine. Okay, just a few words um, on the market uh, analysts. Not at all my specialty, but anyway, I give you just some input related to our project. Uh, so, the market for macroalgae is growing rapidly, uh, this, despite uh, despite uh, high production costs. So the most commonly cultivated species are. Spirulina, Chlorella, Denalella, Hematococcus, and Schizochytrium, or similar. Uh, so, um, most of the macroalgae cultivated on industrial scale are used in the food uh, compound market, but also in other markets such as nutraceutic, animal feed, or dye or medical uh, markets. Uh, the most commonly extracted compound or ingredients are carotenoid, fecobiloproteins, um, omega 3 PUFA especially EPA DHA. Uh, and then the, the price can be very uh, variable depending on the product, the product and its uh, degree of refining. 
Uh, and today we have very little information on the market of peptides uh, produced from macroalgae. It's very, uh, it's pretty new uh, uh, compounds that is uh, explored. And finally, yeah, I would just take the case of the long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid. We indeed justify the choice of the macroalgae that we decide to cultivate in our project. So um, one of the reasons is that most of the EPADHA used in the industry come from small uh, pelagic fish oil, which are obtained through large industrial fishing and processing. There is a very strong demand uh, for these compounds, especially uh, in the aquaculture sector. They are using about 80% of the uh, small pelagic uh, fish oils, uh, but also in the sector of the food supplement for human nutrition. Uh, so this put quite some pressure on the price of this commodity. And uh, the, the problem is that the fisheries of small uh, pelagic fish, mainly sardine and anchovy, is a declining resource in the context of uh, global overfishing. Um, so, um, so for several years now, the production of this uh, uh, omega-3 proof for biomacroalgae cultivation has been uh, de developing as an alternative solution to meet the growing demand for that compound. So, so far, although the price for macroalgae oil is still higher than the source of fish oil, a productivity gain uh, should help to uh, get close to, uh, to close the, the price gap. And uh, also, uh, there is a, a growing societal uh, demand uh, regarding the use of uh, renewable uh, resource, which apply, of course, to omega-3 uh, profile. Thank you for attention, and I will uh, consider your uh, your your question uh, after the, the the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, just again remind you, if you want to ask any question to Philip, please put them in the Q and A section. And uh, after Florian talk, we will have uh, two speakers to answer your question. So thank you, Philip, very much. It's really informative and really nice presentation. Thank you very much. And now I would like to present you Florian Fernandez who is a researcher from Swansea University with expertise in micro and macroalgae. And Florian has lots of experience to work in a variety of European and national and international projects. And also a part of Algae ID team, she has uh, developed optimization process for the treatment of digestate to use as a substrate for the nutrient source for microalgal cultivation at pilot scale. And also she led feed trial on Nile tilapia looking at the use in aquafeed formulated from microalgae grown and digestate to replace fish meal with them aim to provide more sustainable feed to the aquaculture set sector. Then results of this trial Florian will show us today. Thank you very much and the floor is yours Florian. Thank you for the introduction Ala. Uh, right. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Uh, so, yeah, I'll be presenting uh, a follow-up of what Philip has just been uh, introducing, and uh, mainly that's the experiment we've been doing at Swansea University for our RDAD work package capitalization. And we've been uh, looking at using uh, biomass of Cenedismus uh, obliquus uh, grown on digestate to formulate um, a diet for Nile tilapia. So I'm um, going back um, again to the RDAD circular, circular economy uh, concept, uh, where uh, our main aim was to use um, digestates to grow microalgae and then use this biomass for animal feed. And uh, our capitalization work package uh, has been looking uh, to develop a more um, sector that could use this uh, Digestate. Uh, namely, we've been looking at aquaculture, so trying to develop an aqua feed from our biomass. Um, so, in order to provide a new market for digestate direct uh, microalgae uh, and a new market for the AD sector as well. Uh, the aim also was to reduce the cost of macroalgal ingredients. Uh, as Philippe just mentioned, uh, this can be quite costly to produce. But using digestate uh, allows to reduce the cost mainly linked to nutrients to produce the biomass and uh, also improve sustainability and economical value for the aquaculture sector. 
and uh, finally uh, contributing to reduce reliance uh, of, uh, on natural fish stock uh, to provide fish meal and fish oils for, for aquaculture. So I'm just going to dive right in into our uh, experimental design. Um, similarly to uh, Philippe's experiment, we have also used uh, hydrolysate for the feed formulation. So I will not describe the, the, the process again. Um, but so we've used this uh, hydrolysate of Cenedismus obliquus and uh, mixed it with several ingredients uh, in order to, to formulate the feed. Uh, we passed the substance through an extruder and obtained this uh, spaghetti-like uh, substance that you can see on the second picture here. Uh, and once we've dried this for about a couple hours, we, we blitzed it and obtained uh, these pellets. Uh, so this method was quite robust and quite convenient because we could also alter the size of the pellet, which was really convenient because we could increase the size of the pellet with increases uh, size uh, of the, the, the fish um, as they were growing during the trial. And our feed formulation was as followed in this table and we have replaced um, a fish meal. We still had fish meal, uh, which was about 5% of the formulated diet, but we replaced most of it and added 10% of our Senedesmus hydrolysate. And we've compared this uh, algae AD feed to a commercial feed uh, during our experiments. So this is our experimental setup. Uh, so just a few of the tanks uh, that were used during the experiment. Uh, so as I said, we've compared a commercial feed to our formulated algae AD feed and tested the different conditions in a duplicate with 50 fish per tank, uh, totaling 200 fish. And we were feeding um, the fish at a level of 4% of their total biomass every day, um, splitting the, the, the feeding um, twice a day. And we also follow different abiotic conditions to make sure that uh, the fish were grown in the right conditions of temperature, pH, fluoride, et cetera, just to make sure that the, the welfare conditions were, were met uh, during the trial. And then regarding sampling, so we did a baseline at the beginning of the experiment uh, to make sure that we had a representative uh, sample to, to compare um, our different conditions. And then uh, every other week, we carried out a sample of uh, different fish per tank and did the size and weight. Uh, we also took samples of um, the gut to look at the microbiome. Uh, and we did Minayan sequencing to obtain uh, the, the DNA identity of the different bacteria found in the Nile tilapia guts. And we also took a sample of the fillet, so the flesh of the fish, in order to look at the fatty acid content using mass uh, spectrophotometry. Uh, and we did all, all of the sorts of um, other measurements to look at the welfare and the global weight of the fish to make sure that we were feeding the right amount every week. So now on to the results. So size and weight uh, of the fish. So as you can see on this first uh, graph, so the commercial feed yielded better growth um, globally uh, with the fish um, quadrupling in weight. Uh, after a month of experiment, while um, in the algae AD uh, diet, they only doubled in size. Uh, so we had similar results with the size and also the total biomass per tank. Um, however, so the algae AD feed produced lesser performances compared to the commercial feed, but looking at the welfare of the animals, we didn't lose any fish and there was no signs um, of distress or any other um, adverse effects of the algae AD feed. So that was overall quite positive. Um, but then when we've looked more closely at the microbiome, uh, we had um, an insight as to why the, the growth was lesser for the algae AD feed. Uh, so if you look at the bacterial composition in the guts, so you can see that after 15 days of experiment, um, the gut microbiome composition is quite different between 
the commercial media and the sorry the commercial uh, diet and the RGAD diet. Um, so this this sort of um, gave us the information that there was probably an acclimation happening um, in the fish uh, fed with the RGAD feed. Uh, because of the change in their diet, the gut microbiome changed and uh, consequently uh, their capacity to absorb nutrients and digest them was um, reduced and the smaller growth. Uh, however, after 29 days of experiments, so at the end of the experiment, we could see that the gut microbiome uh, was similar again between the commercial media sorry, diet and the RGAD feed. So showing that this acclimation was only uh, temporary and that the gut microbiome could recover and go back to sort of normal levels or at least comparable levels uh, to a commercial feed. Um, so yeah, so there was a clear acclimation here that was probably responsible for the lesser growth that we observed uh, earlier. However, when we looked also at the older level of the gut microbiome composition, we also found out that there was a higher diversity in the gut microbiome of the fish under the RGAD feed diet. And uh, from the literature, we know that a higher microbial diversity is better for fish health and uh, also improves immunity. So we had a clear advantage here provided by the RGAD feed after the acclimation phase, which was from our results about 15 days. So that was quite positive result as well here. Uh, then we've also looked at the fatty acid composition of the fish fillets. And overall, we had really good results um, because after 29 days of experiment, we had higher levels of total fatty acids, uh, PUFAs, um, and also SFAs and uh, MUFAs. Uh, so there was really good results overall. Uh, we also had higher levels of uh, omega-6 generally. So here we could see that there was a clear improvement of the flesh quality uh, directly linked to the, the RGAD feed, um, yeah, the diet. Um, and then uh, looking at our feed composition, we sort of knew that um, the, the, the high amounts of fatty acid found in the Senedesmus were directly metabolized by the fish and then found in the flesh. So at least we knew that the quality of our feed was then found again in the quality of the flesh. And finally, from a nutritional value, when we looked at the omega-3, omega-6 ratio, we found that it was quite close to one, which was really good because if these values are associated with lower risk of developing allergies or inflammatory and cardiovascular disease. So this provided a clear advantage as well uh, of the RGAD feed in terms of uh, quality of the flesh in the Nile tilapia. And so uh, a higher um, value for the, the aquaculture sector. So still we had a lesser growth um, because of the RGAD feed. So we did an additional trial to, to try to see if we could improve the growth performances. And this time, instead of using the RGAD feed alone, we used it as a supplement. Uh, so we used it um, at four, so 1% 1 of the RGAD feed was added to 4% uh, of the commercial feed. And this was uh, compared again uh, to the commercial feed on its own. And overall, um, so we had quite good results in terms of, grow of growth because that was uh, clearly improved because the fish grew way faster uh, with the RGAD supplement um, rather than with the commercial uh, diet on its own. Uh, we found the same positive results as in the previous uh, trials, so a better microbiome composition with a higher microbial diversity. Uh, also higher uh, levels of total fatty acids and other fatty acids, and again, a good uh, omega-3, omega-6 ratio. So overall, quite positive results with um, the RGAD feed used as a supplement because we found all the, the, the same advantages as before, but without the issue of the growth being uh, a bit less uh, good for, for this uh, trial. So to conclude on this experiment, so we found that there was clear advantages of the RGAD feed 
uh, in terms of microbial activity and immunity, and also uh, the quality of the, the flesh in terms of fatty acid. We also found that uh, replacing the commercial feed with the RGAD feed would clearly improve marketability and bring value uh, of the, the products to the aquaculture sector. However, we also found that a progressive replacement of a standard feed by a new diet would be the best way to go because it would avoid having um, disturbances of the fish physiology, which we sort of observed during our first trial with the gut microbiome being quite disturbed by the new diet. So that would be the way to go to introduce a new, a new diet progressively, especially with microalgae. So, and so we demonstrated here that there was uh, a feasibility of using microagol ingredient uh, produced from digestate to replace uh, fish meal, um, which is a uh, real added value for the aquaculture sector. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I just want to thank as well uh, my colleagues who all participated to this experiment. So Ala Sirkina, Raul Capo, Jose Gallo Palaez, uh, Louise Hall, and Carol Devlin, and all the other contributors uh, from the RG team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Florian. Uh, now I would like to invite Philippe and Florian come to uh, open the video and micro for the Q and I session. Thank you very much, all the participants who was uh, really active in uh, ans asking question. Some of the questions were answered by Philippe, but I will still would like you to, to get a um, vocal answer for this, or for those who couldn't, couldn't get access to the Q&A session. Okay, so first question to Philippe, and uh, do you know if the efficiency of uh, omega-3 uptake from um, A mangrove uh, total s supplied, total available in fish? Um. That's, uh, yeah, that we have not yet finished that. Uh, we have tried to um, estimate how much, I mean, the question is whether we can calculate it from the results we obtained. So yeah, I think we could. So that's something we will try to see how much we put in the tank, how much have been, uh, how do you say, put in the fish uh, and see, try to calculate yeah, the, the assimilation rate or things like that. So, but then I will discuss with people with more experience with fish nutrition to do that kind of uh, calculation of assimilation rate. But from, yeah, it seems pretty good as far as I can say. But uh, yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. That's something I, I wish to, to calculate here. All right, thanks, Philippe. Um, another question is for both of you. So how the granule type feed are produced? So Philippe and Florian. <coughs> um, that's uh, maybe I didn't, or I think I mentioned it, but anyway, yeah, we use a subcontractor uh, in the in South of France. So I don't know exactly what technique it did use. I think it's extrusion. And the, the size of the, the granules depends on the size of fish. Uh, I think ours was, um, I may say something wrong, but then that's, it is uh, made uh, according to the size of the fish you want, but that, that's, we, we haven't done it uh, ourselves, but, but Florian did, I think, uh, so. Yeah, we've done uh, our feed uh, ourselves, so we've just found the formulation that was quite common to, to a lot of the literature and just apply that, so we purchased all the different ingredients basically mixed them together and added 30% uh, of water. So we, we could have something that was quite wet uh, and then pass that through an extruder, uh, dried it, and then blended the, uh, the results after extrusion to get uh, the different pellet sizes. So as Philippe said, the pellet size depended on the size of the mouth of the fish, because if it's too big, they can't eat it. So we had to start with quite sm small sizes at the beginning of the trial because we had really small fish and then we could increase the size progressively as the fish grew. All right, thank you. So another question for both of you. So um, from Andre, but is asking then, which means then big part of the biomass will be not eaten by fish, right? So could you kind of comment what's the leftover was after the feeding process? 
I mean, that's uh, it's, it's linked to the previous question about the assimilation rate. Um, and of course, we haven't done it for proteins, but based on the, the assimilation of lipid, maybe we can uh, yeah, estimate that it, it worked pretty well with uh, protein as well. So uh, we, I mean, the people who run the experiment haven't seen any uh, excess of uh, faces or problems that everything seemed that they they pretty much digest the whole thing. So uh, we, we haven't observed any problem that, uh, suggest, that would suggest that they didn't really uh, digest the macroalgae. So, um, and the, the, the one we use also was pretty fragile uh, cells. So um, pretty confident that uh, it has been uh, the whole cells, the whole macroalgae biomass were uh, digest and assimilate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the growth was uh, equivalent to the control. So that, that would be my... Uh, Okay, Benchmark. and could you uh, comment on it as well for the observation of uh, non eating Yes, same. Uh, we, we did a few sort of uh, practice run before we started the proper experiment to make sure that we were giving the right amount of food, so not too much and not too little, uh, which is why we ended up with this sort of four or five percent of the whole fish biomass. And um, same, we didn't observe um, leftovers of, of feed after the, the feeding or, or excess uh, of feces in the tanks after the feeding either. So yeah, also pretty confident that uh, most of the feed was incorporated and, and digested by, by the fish. Okay, thank you. So next question is for Florian. Um, did you check whether the algae is completely digested with fecal residues? Yeah, we didn't carry out the analysis of the, the fecal residues, um, so I couldn't really directly respond to that. Uh, so that's something that could be looked at later on. But then, while well, we did the, the gut microbiome, so yeah, we've looked we've looked at that and and yeah, and doing the dissections, we sort of observed that you know everything seemed to be well in terms of feces, if that's if that's appropriate. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. The next question is um, for both of you. So many thanks for presentation. Is there anything to say about the transfer of contamination slash pathogen from the digestate to the microalgae into the fish tissue? Are there any uh, prominent legal hurdles for this to be implemented in practice? I think it's a really good question. Uh, that's a very <laughs> excellent question. Thank you yeah. for asking. Uh, actually, that's too bad. I had two slides about the, the, the safety issue that we, we uh, develop in the, in the project. So yes, we control uh, the presence of um, pathogens, especially the pig one, uh, for, uh, at, in the, the, the different digestate we use. And then we also look, at that, look for that pathogen in the produce microalgae biomass. And so it was pretty much uh, clean. Uh, and so we didn't test, uh, check further in the animal feed, but uh, based on the result we obtained of, of the microalgae biomass, which were clean, uh, most or pretty much free of pathogen. So, uh, but that's something that has to be uh, repeat and uh, do uh, on a regular basis. The problem is, uh, I mean, the, it's not that a big issue with fish because the pathogen from the pig are different from the one you can find in the, in the fish. But nevertheless, that's something we 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 want to control the the microbial quality of the the macro the macroalgae biomass we, we did produce. But uh, yeah, it's a very very important question, and also it's a big issue for regulation uh, whether or not we can use uh, the a biomass uh, macroalgae biomass produced on digestate. Okay, thanks, Philip. Florian, do you have anything to comment? Uh, yeah, just regarding the regulation, because that's something we've been looking at within the project and uh, the main finding so far was that it, it's quite a blurry regulation because macroalgae are still considered as novel ingredients, so there is not much background there. But also um, what we found is that using plant-based digester was probably safer for animal feed utilization. Uh, because there was no risk of uh, quite bad contamination, for example. So, so that's, that, that was part of the answer using plant-based digestate. Um, but again, going back to the digestate, we also use um, a membrane filtration process, which removes um, most, if not all, the pathogens from the digestate. So even from the production um, 
side of things, we're already in quite a clean environment without uh, harmful pathogens. So yeah, so we're quite confident that um, no pathogens are going to the biomass and then to the feed. So yeah, it's quite a safe process. Uh. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Have another question from Andrea, but I think it's mainly for Philippe, but maybe for Floriana. So um, so. Andrea is asking, you talk about the hydrolysate, so I understand it's consistent part of the microalgae will be hydro, hydrosoluble, which means they will dissolve in the fish growing medium, no? Um, not, not really, uh, it, it's just uh, the, 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 we use the enzyme to hydrolate biomass to release peptides and also lipids, and then we dry it, and then we include it in the feed, so no, it was, uh, and the feed is dry. Um, so uh, it, it's not uh, it doesn't make the it doesn't make the microalgae soluble in the water. Just it's still uh, included. Uh, the whole thing is included in the in the fish feed. Okay, Florian, do you want to comment because it's probably the same actually, is it? Yeah, it's same. I mean, when when we put the, the feed in in the water, the the point is that they stay all together, so the fish can get to them, so they don't dissolve at all. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so the next question is for you. So, what is the uh, protein percentage of Senedesmus hydrolysate used in a fish trial? Yeah, so that was uh, one of the main advantages as well as using this, this particular biomass is that we had a protein content of about 84%, uh, which was actually higher when the Senedesmus was grown on digested compared to Senedesmus grown on normal F over two media, for example, or another commercial media. So yes, it was a high protein content uh, thanks to growing it on digestate. Okay, super, thank you very much. So another question from Andrea asking why you started from different fish weight when comparing algae and commercial? Maybe it's mainly for Philippe? Yeah, so, so for the first trial, so we started from the same weight because we had the same uh, cluster of fish, but for the additional trial, because it was a direct follow-up of the, the first part of the experiment, we had this, this difference in the weight, uh, because if you remember, the, the ones in the Diagi AD feed uh, grew less, so we started from this smaller weight. So I understand that um, the comparison might not be fully relevant, but still we we seen that uh, the increase in growth was way better uh, still, even though we started with um, fish that, that, that were smaller in size and weight. So, yeah, so that, that, that's why it's because we started from this first trial that given that gave this result and we didn't want to, to mix all the, the fish together because of welfare concerns of changing their environment, so namely changing them uh, from their initial tanks, so yeah, so that's why we went from this this point uh, for the second trial. Okay, thank you, Florian. So thanks, Philippe. Fully agree. Uh, the point on scaling up uh, replacement of conventional fish feed with algae base depends on the good arguments, good data, and reducing the price. Uh, what action, in your view, would be needed at European Union scale to achieve this? Oof. <laughs> Very complex question. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading uh, again. Um, I, I guess it's uh, yeah. Um, one way to uh, reduce the price. I mean, it's very uh, um, general trend in France and I guess in Europe. It's just to um, get uh, all kind of production close to each other. So the the idea, the what we see. Uh, we are in Brittany, um, in Finisterre, and the idea is to, and so we're working with some people, um, uh, manufacturer of uh, aquafeed or fish feed. So the, the idea is to, to make as close as possible the production of the macroalgae, even in the same place if possible. Uh, and so uh, one idea also like uh, what we have to do, uh, I, I mentioned we have to uh, freeze for storage because the done processing has could it be done right away? But the, and then he, we had to dry it because the, uh, the, the, the techniques to prepare the fish feed need to be dry. But there's new techniques that can use wet, uh, some part of a wet uh, produce uh, because the, at the end, the, the, the fish feed is like 15% of water. So it means you can include 15% of uh, wet 
ingredients at the at the production of the fish feed. So it means that if we are close enough, that uh, we don't have to dry the biomass. We can just inject it or include it right away at the 15 percent rate uh, in the in the aqua feed. So that will reduce a lot um, the cost of the of the ingredient. A big part of the cost in our project, uh, I mean, is, is drying because it's using a lot of energy, of course, because uh, you need heat, uh, especially for spray drying or whatever the technique you are using, you're using a lot of energy. So one way to reduce the cost is to avoid that uh, drying step um, and, and also avoid uh, limits, at least transportation from microalgae production and the fish feed production. Um, so that that will be that's it is pretty much our strategy our regional strategy here in france okay thank you philip so next question from jay um sorry uh thank you florian for the nice presentation is acclimatization of the gut microbiome towards algae didi depends on the fish species selected so I would say yes, um, because from the literature, we see that there is almost consistently a change in the gut microbiome once the diet has changed for any sort of species you saw. Now tilapia in this case, but also sea bass, sea bream. I have other examples from the literature. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's, it's mainly because you, you're giving them something completely different to what they used to. So obviously the gut flora is going to have to adapt to that and change and probably the the relation between the different um, uh, bacteria in the community is going to change as well so mainly dominance of one or another order or specific species is going to change so yeah i would say that it's it's it's, it's common to to a lot of species and it's it's it, it's common to us as well it also happens for us if we change our diet our macroflora is also changing so yeah Okay, thank you, Florian. So another question is asking about rationale to using Senedesmos digestate. Uh, uh, yeah, we didn't use Senedesmos digestate, but okay, using Senedesmos for this study doesn't provide alternative omega-3. Right, so I think it's maybe two, two questions here. So I'm understanding why using digestate. So because you get cheaper nutrients and that's the whole circular economy concept of the project. Yes. And then why use Synedesmus? So because it had a high protein content, so it had potential to replace fish meal in, uh, in formulated um, aqua feed. And then regarding the lipids, so we didn't know if we would find uh, alternative uh, fatty acids or more fatty acids, but um, from the composition analysis of the biomass, we know we have uh, a, a good level of fatty acids in the Senedesmus. So that helps in selecting the species for this sort of trials. And then our results of fatty acids in the flesh shows that this lipid composition from Senedesmus was also found in, in the, the tilapia flesh because it was metabolized from the senedesmus, so the main ingredient of the feed. So, so, yeah, so that was the rationale. Uh, for the protein, we knew there was more in there. For the lipids, we didn't know, but we found out as we were doing the experiment. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Super. Yeah, I can add that, yeah, depending on the fish uh, species, some have more or less ability to uh, produce uh, the long chain Omega three, omega three, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. But in Senedesmus, you have the, the short chain. I could say like eighteen carbons. So like tilapia, I think have some ability to to uh, uh, elongate, desaturate this one. So it will be in some case, like for the marine fish, you, that that would work because they they really need to have the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid in the feed. But for some other species, that's may not necessary. So it really depends on the 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 the, the, the matching between the, the macroalgae you're producing and the fish you want to produce at the end. Okay, thank you. Um, I think so other questions was already more or less answered because there's some um, uh, repeat questions and like some other than was starting point of the fish with commercial and uh, experimental data what Florian already answered. So Eli, I hope it's answering for you. So some really last question is not related to exactly the results of the project, but what is your opinion of using seaweed as a fish feed mm -hmm. and which group of seaweed would be better for fish feed? So maybe Florian, you can comment on it. 
Yeah, so I think that's something that's been looked at uh, already. So yeah, I think that's also a really good ingredient to try to to replace fish meals and oils in in, in aquafit. And then species wise, the thing is, it's again, it's like what Philip said. It's about having a, sus a sustainable production pipeline. So you know, if you're based in Northwest Europe, I would say use local species that are available there or easily farmable. Um, but if you are in, in Southeast Asia, it's going to be a whole different range of species. Uh, luckily, seaweeds are really rich in, in all sorts of polysaccharides and proteins and, and others, so, so it wouldn't be too difficult to find the right species. But it's again, finding this balance of having an, a good production pipeline and being able to extract the, the, the significant compounds of interest that would, that would just like trip this balance to have a, a sustainable and and valuable and economically uh, relevant feed. So, so yeah, that's the main thing I would say. All right. Yeah, if one issue also like for the included inclusion of plant uh, proteins or in the fish feed, it's the digestibility also, and it may require also some hydrolysis process before including in the. So that's uh, yeah. Really, it will depend on the species of macroalgae that you, you, you intend to include in, in it. But the, the, you will have pretty much the same problem than including pens. Yeah. Uh, so some of the questions about the protein and lipid and carbohydrate content. I think so when we'll, these results will be published, you can see the full profile and so on. And very, very last question. So have you any idea of selling cost? of algal biomass grown and digested to be used as a raw material for aqua feed. I don't know if you, any of your opinion, <laughs> or both of you. <laughs> uh, I mean, we know the price of the, the, the one we use, uh, the schizochytrium biomass, uh, is 11 euro per uh, kilograms uh, dry uh, biomass. So then we have to be below that. That's it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Because it's, uh, it's already available on the market, so it's uh, the dry biomass of schizocotrium exists, and so uh, yeah, the, we have to target something. Uh, we have to be low, lower than that. And for Senedesmus, it's probably even lower than this, so should be. <laughs> okay, right. So I will thank you all, participants and speakers as well, and um, AC3A for organizing this fantastic webinar. And um, if you have any additional questions or you would like to see the replay, you, it will be possible for you. So uh, I would like to tell you that we are planning to uh, have another uh, webinar soon. So one will be um, uh, talking about um, macroalgae grown and digested as a pig feed. So pig feed trial was also carry on in algae AD project and results will be uh, uh, shown to you uh, on one of the webinar will be in December and in January we prepare another webinar which will be focusing on decision support tool to grow microalgae on digestate and this tool will be available for all stakeholders so how it works and what will be uh, um, what will be uh, for you to, to test and also we have lots of video on uh, our uh, YouTube channel and our website so please have a look and if you have any questions, so please uh, send it to us. Uh, I would like to thank you all again. And um, uh, please keep in touch and we will be welcome you on other webinars. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>